Hello, welcome at Café Weltschmerz. I'm your host Elsa van Hamelen, and today I have a very special guest, Naomi Wolf. She almost needs no introduction, but you're of course the uh, best-selling author, the CEO of a tech company. You're pivotal in bringing out the Pfizer paper information. And today you're making a tour, this week, a tour around the Netherlands. Yes. And we're talking about her newest book, uh, Oog in Oog met the Beest, Facing the Beast. And it's been translated by the Dutch uitgeverij Succesboeken. So welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be with you. Wonderful. So in your book, you reference a previous book a number of times, at The End of America, and you say there are 10 steps towards tyranny. And I was wondering, what are those 10 steps? Um, that is a great question. So I was fortunate in a way um, after 2020 to realize quickly what was happening, mm -hmm. um, that it wasn't as simple as a public health emergency, that it was a, the measures, the lockdowns, the masking, the forced injections, the closing of businesses, the transfer of assets, the driving us all onto digital platforms, the emergency law that was all over the United States and no doubt Western Europe as well, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, um, that this was uh, a manifestation of a global coup. And I was able to recognize that because of this previous book I had written uh, in the Bush era, 2007, called The End of America. And indeed, as you note, um, there I identified that there are always 10 steps that would be tyrants take um, to close an open society or crush a democracy. Uh, and it doesn't matter if those tyrants are on the left or on the right, they mm -hmm. always take the same 10 steps. So it starts with a uh, state of emerge, a, 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 a statement that there is an emergency, mm -hmm. an invocation of a crisis, right? And it can be a real crisis or like 9-11 or a fake crisis. It really doesn't matter. It, it, if you have a real crisis, you just hype the crisis, right? Mm -hmm. you, you hystericize it. Um, you message it. And I, I point out often that in, you know, real disasters and real conflict areas with real leadership, people try to calm the population down mm -hmm. to survive rather than freak them out yes. more fully, <laughs> right? Um, second, you create a uh, surveillance society, um, neighbors snitching on neighbors, uh, cameras everywhere, um, people following people. Uh, you create a thug cast, uh, like uh, mercenaries. Um, these, mm -hmm. you know, recently in Canada and in France, uh, during the lockdown years, there were these unidentified police among mm -hmm. the police who didn't have badges, didn't have names, um, looked like mercenaries to me, you know, and mm -hmm. they were very, very violent, for instance. We had that in Europe as well. Indeed, yep. I, I'm so sorry, yeah. Um, you create a place outside the rule of law. That's step number four, uh, like Guantanamo, or you um, change the law so you can detain people without charge or trial, mm -hmm. right? Um, you start to criminalize speech. You start to criminalize thought. You start to uh, call criticism of the government um, sabotage or um, hate speech or uh, you know subversion. Mm -hmm. uh, you start to target journalists. Um, you start to target opposition leaders. You start to uh, target um, citizen uh, freedom fighters mm -hmm. like uh, religious people with scruples or um, uh, union leaders. Uh, and I'm going to fast forward to step number 10, which is emergency law, martial law. Mm -hmm. And by that time, the citizens no longer have the means to get their democracy back. So our crackdown and probably yours and this same script around the world in 2020 started with step 10, which was emergency law. Mm -hmm. And I realized by June of 2020 um, in New York state where our governor had enacted emergency law right away and then said in June, you can't have more than six people in your home at one time, which is totally unconstitutional, mm -hmm. right? In the US, the first amendment says freedom of assembly. It's very simple, freedom of assembly, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I realized we're not going to get out of this without, a, he's never going to let us out, you know, that, mm -hmm. <laughs> without a fight. And, uh, and, and yeah, they started with step 10 and that's the goal. And many states still uh, are under emergency law. The federal government is under emergency law. People don't realize it, mm -hmm. but under emergency law, you can do anything essentially. And what the, I promise I'll pause in a minute, but what it's so relevant right now, because we're heading into April in May, 
the mm -hmm. WHO, the World Health Organization, mm -hmm. is going to uh, try to pass a treaty that suspends all of our sovereignty and gives them the power unilaterally to declare a pandemic, which is an, a word that was really made up pretty recently or mm -hmm. you know, minted pretty recently. And if they do that, they get to declare emergency law anywhere they want around the world. So mm -hmm. it's, it's their militia, it's their uh, law, it's their quarantine camps, it's them dragging you off, them separating you from your kids. It's very, very serious. So in the U.S., is the, is the EAHR valid? Did the congressman subscribe to it? Like emergency yes. law? Well, it wasn't. So the horrible thing about emergency law is it doesn't have to be legislated. Right, it can be declared unilaterally. So the president uh, declared emergency law, and on a state level, our governors declared emergency mm -hmm. law. It didn't go through the assembly. And then what many state uh, legislatures found, to their horror mm -hmm. and shame on them, this is like the number one. It's like Democracy 101. How do uh -huh. you stop emergency law? Right? They they should know that. But they found out to their horror that in many cases, state law did not allow them to end the emergency law or to override the governor. Um, so there was there were a lot of battles, uh, like in New Hampshire and Maine at the state level, to mm -hmm. give the power to limit emergency law or to decide on it back to the legislature. Okay, so in the Netherlands, in our constitution, there was a clause adopted that we abide by international treaties, which is very odd. But I understood that in the US, very often the international treaties are not ratified mm -hmm. because if you, um, if you sell out to another country, it's treason. Right. So that very often co congressmen, they don't endorse the treaty uh, with their signature because they could be uh, prosecuted for it. Is that correct? I had not heard that, but I hope it's true. <laughs> I mean, think about, think about one of the reasons I'm so excited to be in Europe, and I think it's so important, mm -hmm. and I want to credit Success Spoken and the Netherlands for being the first country to let me in, <laughs> right, <laughs> um, after the lockdowns and after I became a non-person because of the, what I was saying, um, is that I'm very worried about the way that European states have had their sovereignty drained from them, picked mm -hmm. apart by the EU, and, and diluted and diluted bit by bit by bit. Mm -hmm. Fascinating, brilliant tactic by the European Union to lull Europeans into comfort because, and I lived in Europe for many years, you know, while mm -hmm. this was happening in Britain, um, you know, which was then part of Europe. Uh, what is the EU? It's free admission to museums. It's human rights law. It's environmental law. It's equality for women. It's, you know, tulips. <laughs> right? <laughs> right? And, and so you sort of think this is awesome. And this brilliant propaganda that the EU and the European Parliament is a meta-democracy when, in fact, I looked deeply into mm -hmm. how do you pass a law in Europe, in the European Parliament? Mm -hmm. How do citizens lobby? How do they stop or launch bills at, mm -hmm. you know, citizens of Portugal, the citizens of Greece, the citizens of Holland, and you can't do it, right? Yeah. And I was looking for the legislative database of the EU, and, and I was like, it's nowhere. You can't find the legislative database. It doesn't exist. And I run a database company uh -huh. that sh shows people legislative databases, right? This is my job. And I'm like, this doesn't exist. You can't <laughs> find the laws they're going to pass in the European mm -hmm. Parliament. You can't stop them. You can't lobby for them. The people who pass them are not accountable. They're not elected. You can't get rid of them. Um, and but the Parliament doesn't even have the right to, to petition a law. No! It's a total, it is a coup. The European Parliament is already a coup. And, and it's just dressed up so nicely that many people don't understand this. Mm -hmm. um, and I was astonished. I was tweeting about this. You know, hey, everyone, there is no legislative database that you can find or act on for the European Parliament. And I, I had the EU press officer hounding me and trying to distract me, but they couldn't cover uh -huh. the fact that there is no way to intervene in the law in the European Parliament. Anyway, that was shocking to me because I understood that even though when I found that out in maybe 2017, um, things were still nice here, mm -hmm. but that under that superstructure, the, the, the guillotine could come down at any time and yes. the people of any sovereign formerly sovereign nation in Europe would be vulnerable. The laws are nice now. They're, you know, letting you in. They're giving you benefits. They're giving you free education. Overnight, that could change, and you will have no recourse. And that's exactly what's happened. Exactly. 
But in some ways, that happened in the U.S. as well, right? In what regard? That uh, there are a lot of practices and laws that people really feel that they really can't act against anymore, like the like the mass surveillance or the emergency laws or the COVID laws, or are there more opportunities for recourse? It's interesting you say that. I mean, this is why this, these conversations um, between Europe and America mm -hmm. and freedom fighters in Europe and America are so important. Um, if the algorithm is mm -hmm. telling Europe that, that's interesting. The algorithm is telling America that there are no freedom fighters in Europe except the farmers. Right? <laughs> really? Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I think there is a lot of silencing of the algorithm, uh, of, of the resistance around the world. Um, certainly, uh, things like the NSA's surveillance mm -hmm. of us is difficult to legislate against. But we're really in a renaissance in the United States of people, and I really want to credit my own company, Daily Cloud, for innovating this because we mm -hmm. built a database so people could see any state or federal bill, share it through social media, start or stop a bill. We taught people to lobby. We draft bills. We pass bills. We passed a bill in uh, 2021 to end emergency law, take masks off kids, uh, free assembly, open schools. Um, and it passed in 33 states. Now we've drafted a, an elections integrity bill. But the point is, we're in a renaissance of people actually learning how to lobby, especially at the state level, mm -hmm. draft their own bills, pass their own bills. Um, and 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 they're lobbying their um, federal representatives as well. Mm -hmm. So you do see, if you go to Daily Clout, go to billcam.io, you'll see in the top trending bills, a lot of really exciting bills that citizens have lobbied for. For mm -hmm. instance, to defund the World Health Organization, to remove the PrEP Act so we can sue Pharma, mm -hmm. Pfizer, uh Moderna, um, to, um, uh, to close the Department of Education, which is sexualizing our chil children in a weird way, um, to get uh, nonprofits out of the election process, which is what our draft bill does as well. You know, many really good bills. So yes, some are mm -hmm. difficult to dislodge because they're, they're not bills, right? The NSA mm -hmm. spying on us is not a, it's no. not a law. It's, mm -hmm. a, it's an, an agency exceeding its mandate, right? Yes. But it's an intelligence agency, uh -huh. which is classified. So it's hard to stop them from exceeding their mandate, right? Mm -hmm. But um, legislatively, I think citizens are in a real positive revolution around um, uh, holding uh, legislation accountable to them. And this is both on state and fed federal level? Easier on the state level, um, but I see it really happening on the federal level as well. And how do you see, because I get the sense that that there are a couple of states that are kind of resisting the, the federal mandates more and more, um, and perhaps they want to act more independently. What is their recourse also under the Constitution? I mean, it's so, I'm so grateful to our founders um, and really the revolutions of 1848 in Europe. Mm -hmm. That legacy is very precious as well, and I hope you all don't abandon it. Uh -huh. Like the, I promise I'll answer your question, but I just want to say for a European audience, the more I think about European history as well as American history, the more I conclude that a nation state, a democratic mm -hmm. nation state or a parliamentary nation state with defensible borders, mm -hmm. meaning citizens, yes. is the perfect, best, whatever the you know, flaws, whatever the excesses of history, you can't do better than that. And that's what you all got in Europe in 1848. Not all of you, but, you mm -hmm. know, many modern European nations, you know, were created with par parliaments and representation and borders and citizenship mm -hmm. and, you know, equality under law uh, for religious minorities at that time. And it's a precious legacy that has been attacked and attacked and attacked because it empowers you, right? Mm -hmm. And I mention that because that's kind of, it's not the equivalent of, you know, our state system under a federal system. But if those nation states were intact, you could do what we're doing mm -hmm. now, which is Louisiana saying, hell no, you mm -hmm. know, we're not going to let the WHO have any jurisdiction. Um, and Texas saying, no, we're not going to let these people walk across the border, even though the federal government says we're going to let them walk across the border. We're not going to. Uh, South Dakota never locked down. Mm -hmm. under Governor Kristi Noem, who's a hero. Uh, Florida opened up very early. Um, and so the states, like our system has been set up 
I mean, it's so beautiful. If you read the Constitution, it says any powers not enumerated in the Constitution revert to the states. So it's quite limited, mm -hmm. you know, the way our founders set it up, what the federal government can do. Everything else reverts to the states. Now, the federal government, of course, the way power does, the way the EU does, you know, it metastasizes, it grabs more and more mm -hmm. and more rights, not, uh, not constitutionally. Yes. Uh, but then the recourse, it's so beautiful. Man, it's so beautiful. What the founders put in place was checks and balances, as a three-part mm -hmm. system. You know, the legislative, the executive, which is the president, and the judiciary. Mm -hmm. So what's been happening is a lot of lawsuits by attorneys general at the state level using the courts to rein in the federal government, for instance. And mm -hmm. I promise I'll pause. <laughs> um, I was censored, and I tell the story mm -hmm. in uh, Face of the Beast, uh, for an accurate, important tweet I posted uh, in 2021 warning that women were having menstrual problems upon receiving mRNA injections. Mm -hmm. And I've that's been my beat for 35 years. I cover women's health and sexual health and reproductive health. It made me a feminist icon, beloved around the world, <laughs> right? But times had changed. So I was deplatformed, um, made a non-person, my reputation smeared everywhere. The people who initiated that turned out to be my, my president, uh, putting pressure on Twitter and Facebook directly uh -huh. um, and the CDC. Uh, so how did we find that out? Because of a state attorney general's lawsuit against the Biden administration that revealed that they were silencing critics like me, like Dr. Bhattacharya, Dr. Kuldorf, you know, mm -hmm. distinguished, but it doesn't matter. You know, it's a First Amendment violation, distinguished or not, uh, mm -hmm. critics of what they were doing. So there's a mm -hmm. very active um, effort to hold federal government accountable through the court system. And I mention this because I'm hearing here in the Netherlands that people have tried to do that, but the courts are too corrupt mm -hmm. to uh, adjudicate properly. Yeah, we, there was one judge that, because we had an evening curfew, and there was one judge who ruled and said, it's unconstitutional. And then the president said, well, we have a turbo speed trial. And within three hours, the, 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 this verdict was repealed. And I thought, okay, well, that tells you a lot about the judicial system. It does. Yeah, yeah, that's the exact story that I heard from that lawyer. Um, and that's very disturbing because when I'm thinking, okay, what are the levers here in the Netherlands that will allow you to regain your mm -hmm. sovereignty and your republic? Um, the courts are a very important, mm -hmm. very important lever, and it sounds like they're broken, you know, in that regard. Well, it sounds that the basic structure of governance in the uh, in the U.S. at the outset was already better. Mm -hmm. But would you also say that you're better educated in the Constitution? Because the reason that I asked that as well is in my research, I stumbled upon the importance of property rights. Oh, yeah. And I was never taught that. Mm. And, and the way that these authors were talking about that, they were so aware of their constitutional mm. rights. Mm. And not only the existence of these rights, but why they were important for mm. freedom. Mm. And I thought, I never was taught this at school. Actually, right. what I've been taught would be would make me much more susceptible to uh, accept communism right. than to realize the importance of individual rights. Isn't it crazy that I'm, because I'm having this crisis at this moment intellectually <laughs> too, I'm looking back on my whole education and thinking starting from when I went to Yale in 1980, I was taught <laughs> Marxism. I, like literally, I was taught to accept Marxism. I was, you know, if you look back, <laughs> yeah. you know, we weren't taught, we almost, almost 80% of my expensive education didn't teach me much about the um, incredible legacy of rights uh -huh. and and uh, free speech and so on in in the West, let alone the beautiful civilization of the West. I got some of that, mm -hmm. thank God. Um, but less and less kids are getting less and less now. But it definitely taught me that the state had all the answers. That FDR was the greatest president because he basically created a communist system. <laughs> you know that um, that there should be. Uh, I mean. We were taught, yeah, that capitalism was bad and always excessive and, you yes. know, destructive. There's no such thing as good capitalist outcomes. And, yeah, I mean, I could go on and on. Um, and, and I'm also kind of looking back at the history of art and the history of ideas. And it, starting in, like, 1920, so mm -hmm. clearly, um, 
subverted by kind of a Marxist attack on Western norms of classicism, Western norms of meaning. I mean, I was taught at Yale mm -hmm. that post-structuralism, right? It, it just basically blows up the meaning of Western languages and, and, and the authorial tradition, our beautiful authorial tradition, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the author has no meaning, the author isn't real, truth isn't real, truth is relative, words have no meaning. I mean, <laughs> you know, abstract art, <laughs> you know, and, and I was taught that these are the most prestigious. Um, and, and really looking back, it's just wreckage going, you know, going back a hundred years. Um, anyway, Sorry, back but to your it takes, point. Well, it takes away your capacity to argue these things. Totally, absolutely correct. So let, now, going back to your point about is it knowledge of the Constitution, that certainly helps. Mm -hmm. um, and another thing that helps a lot is that we don't have a tradition of, people have tried, right? But we don't have a tradition of the state taking care of most of our needs. Mm -hmm. So in a way, that's hard because if you want to go to university, you have to find a way to pay for it for the most part, right? Or if you want childcare, you have to find a way to pay for it or healthcare, right? On the other hand, I'm, I'm really counting my blessings right now because I'm seeing that in the Netherlands, mm -hmm. no disrespect to the Netherlands, they've managed to, the state has managed to enslave people essentially by, by giving them these, you know, mm -hmm. and it's a pretty cheap way to enslave people, benefits. And mm -hmm. so people are afraid to speak up because they're afraid they'll lose their benefits. And, um, you sort of, it, it keeps people in this kind of narrow mm -hmm. uh, groove that, that they fear uh, stepping outside of. Um, but I don't think it's just that, because you guys have a constitution. Well, if you read it in detail, and if you go back to the history of it, even in the basic, uh, not just the constitution, but the constitutional structure, the people were never given a lot of say or power or really? influence. Yeah. When, when was your constitution passed? Um, Not I think on AT, the first one, the, the, the one that the kind of based on what we're doing now, I believe it's 1815. Oh, wow. Early. Yeah. Um, but then, uh, nay, yeah, Torbeke, and then uh, there, uh, some major changes have passed. So, um, so that's in the 80s, I believe, 70s, 80s. Wow. But, but th then they inserted a clause, for example, mm. that, we, that the international, th that we, that we stimulate the international law and order. Mm -hmm. And so we will always abide uh, by international treaties that are above our national laws. Oh my God. And well, I there thought, goes your sovereignty. When, when was <laughs> how, that added? How did this pass? <laughs> when was that added? Yeah, I think in the 80s somewhere. Well, yeah. yeah, that's very serious. So a real constitution has within it a way to amend it by the people. Mm -hmm. Do you know how to amend the Dutch constitution? No, we don't. It, well, through the, yeah, so it's through the parliament. Uh, the parliament has to vo vote two-thirds uh, uh, positive twice. So there needs to be like a constitutional change. But then if you see how our parliament is organized, it's basically a political class. Like it's not really a representative no. of the people. Why is that? In what way? Um, it's a it, so they operate through the political parties and you mm. have to go up through the party see, system. Right. And, and so there are professionals. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's it, and so there have been a lot of initiatives to start, uh, start more, um, Consultative? How do you um, consultative? No, no. They just to ask the people directly. Right. Uh, like I have like a, a referendum. Yes, uh -huh. exactly. The yeah. direct democracy. Yeah. Um, and this is held off at bay, and a couple of by the parliamentarians, by the no, no, just parties. by the government, by every. So oh we goodness. voted for. Uh, we had a, a referendum, and this is a consultative referendum about the EU, and the people said no. Right. And then they kind of adapted it, and it was passed. We had a referendum. Wait, I don't understand. Why are you still part of the EU? You're saying the people voted to leave the EU? No, not the, so it wasn't a vote to leave the EU, but it was about the Lisbon Treaty. Okay. And the Lisbon Treaty was a kind of like fake constitution. Right, it, right. And people voted no. And no, they don't want to be part of the Lisbon Treaty? Yes, they, okay. they voted against this okay. Lisbon Treaty, All which... Right. Um, but which, which was also very clearly a vote against the EU. Like, right, we don't want right. to have more EU right. powers, right. more EU influence. Right. So we don't want to have an EU constitution. Right, right. Um, and then they kind of rebranded it and passed it. Well, can I just say, I don't mean to be a bearer of bad news, uh -huh. but from what I understand, 
you guys are already in a coup state. Yeah, for a long time. For yes. a long time. I mean, I understand that people in the Netherlands have voted for a, a new leadership and they haven't been seated yet. And, mm -hmm. and you're waiting and waiting and waiting for your new leadership to be seated. I'm sorry, guys, but that's a, that's a coup. Um, well, this is part of the political class structure. So what happens is we have all these different parties and usually they go and sit around the table and the two or three largest parties, they say, we, fought, we create a coalition, mm -hmm. we will uh, rule together. Yeah. And they create a co coalition agreement. And all of this is not in the constitution. Right. Because you vote for a person and right. that person is your representative. Right, right. So this whole idea that there are the, we call it fraxy. So there are the political parties, they follow, a, they create a group. Right. And within this group, there always needs to be consensus. So even though you vote for someone, they will say, well, I cannot go beyond the consensus of my party. Oh my God. Um, so you have this party consensus, which is kind of cultish. Right. Uh, and then these parties, they need to have this coalition. Right. right. Then you get this agreement, which is all back doors. Yeah. And Everyone has to uh, has has to give in a little bit of their standpoints right, right. because they have to rule with the others, right. and they come with some agreement that nobody ever voted on. Right. Oh my God. And then they say, "This is what we're supposed to do." So wow. what's happening now is not that. That's so basically standard operating procedure. It is. It takes this <laughs> long. To no, see no, not not that. But now, now the. I think they're not a real opposition party, but the so-called opposition right, right, party is right, one. Right. And now everyone says, oh, they are bad, they're oh. extremists, yeah. and they're dangerous, so nobody really wants to rule with them. Right. So, so they can't take power because they can't form a coalition? And, and so now there's all this back and forth of who is going into a coalition with who. Okay, but may I just note something as an American? Uh -huh. No disrespect. The people of the Netherlands voted for this opposition party yes. to take power but they're not getting the opposition party taking power. Exactly. Through, through a set of machinations that are not in the constitution. Yes. That's a coup. So. Yeah, and it's happening for a long time like this already. So I think that's well, also- You guys need to direct democracy respectfully. This parliamentary system is not serving you. No, not at all. No, but what is even worse is the EU that you started with. It's all bad. Like, I don't think you'd be, from what you've just described, you're not going to be much better off, you know, with these corrupt parties in parliament. But yes, you'll be better off than, than with the EU, which doesn't give you any rights and can march you into a concentration camp tomorrow. <laughs> Seriously. Yes. But I mean, I guess what I want to put out into the mind of Europe is that, you know, I, I look deeply in, in the end of America at democratic systems. Mm -hmm. And um, there are experiments with direct democracy in Europe. I, be mm -hmm. I believe uh, Switzerland has such yes. a yeah. system. Um, and it is, I mean, having, having seen the revolution in citizens, understanding what their rights are, knowing how to lobby, lobbying their representatives, mm -hmm. getting rid of the ones that aren't serving them, you know, running mm -hmm. for office themselves in America. Um, it's not complete, but it's, mm -hmm. you know, on its way. And, and seeing how hamstrung the parliamentary system makes citizens, mm -hmm. even when they have their sovereign nation back, right? Like in Britain, right? Mm -hmm. People literally didn't know what to do to stop the lockdowns. And they're nominally mm -hmm. not, not in the EU anymore, right? But they don't have, I mean, look at, look at the images of parliament from Britain. They're not even sitting, there are like three people in parliament, right? It's a, uh -huh. a globalist demonstration to Britain that their parliament doesn't matter. They're not even going to show up, right? And so people don't know how to lobby. They, there is no way to lobby. There's no way to put pressure on parliamentarians. You try to find the laws in Britain and you click through and you get to a dead end. And mm -hmm. then they say on the website, oh, the laws are in scrolls in a library and you, you have to be a lawyer to look at them. It's uh -huh. like, <laughs> anyway, I guess what I want to put into the minds of Europe, and I wonder if I will be able to get home out of Schiphol Airport. Schiphol Airport, I've been taught how to say it correctly. Schiphol yes. Airport um, is that they should trash their parliamentary system, leave the EU, and reconstruct their sovereign nations along the lines of direct democracy. So there are two things that, um, so one is that you write this, in this book or the other, I'm not sure, but you, you write, you say, um, we kind of left 
our, uh, our governance over to the experts. Right. So if we want this type of system that really protects our individual rights, it's us that we have to do it and that the founding fathers also uh, saw it in this way. Can you speak more to it? Yeah. Sure, and I love that follow-up question. And indeed, um, that is from the end of America, which it sounds <laughs> like you've read. Yes, thank you. I may have repeated it in, um, in the prequel to this, which is called uh, The Bodies of Others. Yeah, so if you read our Declaration of Independence, it, it instructs you as an American citizen that if a government is not serve, gets to the point where it's no longer serving the will of the people, it's your obligation, not a, not a right, but it's your duty to overthrow that government. So they intended to create a revolutionary system from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And they, w the way they set up our system, um, it, it isn't the experts, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, supposed to be people from the community running for office. Um, you, term limits, you know, you get rid mm -hmm. of them, then someone else runs. You know, no one, you're, it's, it's set up to try to avoid a political class. Now, inevitably, things decay and there's corruption, especially at the federal level. Mm -hmm. But I've been traveling to let state legislatures in the U.S. and it really is like the car dealer, the teacher, the farmer, you know, it, it, it really is people mm -hmm. who are representing their communities. And there is the presumption, and again, we had to dust off this this tradition recently because we too had gotten lazy and left it to the experts because mm -hmm. times were good. Um, but but our our tradition really does say you know you have to know the laws you have to you have to run for office you have to um, you're not you're you're not allowed to leave it to the experts it's your responsibility to protect the revolution of freedom in every generation uh -huh. but I would say the same thing to Europe you know like they it's I don't mean to hound Europeans but I I just can't believe. This extraordinary, like bait and switch that the EU has manifested in what sixty years of taking people, you know, the mm -hmm. Netherlands that invent the first republic, right? Mm -hmm. The first republic in, kind of invented the idea of local representation, you know, the burger system, and 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 invented the idea of the individual in the modern West, and invented the idea of, of the family with rights, you know, or the individual with rights, and invented the idea of commerce, you know, free markets. I mean, so many, free speech, religious tolerance, and Britain, you know, with their tradition of, of mm -hmm. also they invented free speech and human rights with the Magna Carta, and France with their revolution. You know, I can't believe that in 60 years, the propaganda has taught these people who fought so hard, mm -hmm. World War II, right, to resist fascism and tyranny mm -hmm. and to know what individual rights are, to, to, um, to be lulled into yielding the very mechanism of how you defend your freedom. So this went in a very insidious way. So there's a journalist, British journalist, Perry Anderson, and he wrote three very long articles in the London Review of Book about the emergence of the EU. And so... It started as uh, just economic cooperation. Right. right. And uh, there was the, the treaty for this type of cooperation. And uh, I think there was some arbitrage for conflict. Mm -hmm. But then at some point, they passed uh, a ruling where they say um, uh, all the, all the uh, countries mm -hmm. under the treaty, they need to abide by our rulings. And this was... This was not a power that they had under the treaty. I was going to say, how is that lawful? It was unlawful. And so, but everyone just abided went by it. They went along with it. it they did not ask. <laughs> and so, Mistake so number it's, one. It's very I'm long. It, 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 I, when did that happen? Um, so, I'm not 100% sure. 80s, right. I think. But again, I don't want to blame Europeans uh -huh. because given the mechanism of your parliaments, who are you going to ask? Where are you going to protest, right? Whom are you going to lobby? Can and a lot of right. things are kind of invisible. Right. Like uh, suddenly you're faced with uh, rules and you think, where did these rules come from? Oh, and it's wow. like, oh, the EU, but how is this possible? And then, and then so here... What's an example? Like the lockdowns and the mass? No, no, that's really... Um, so really stupid stuff about uh, standards for production, oh, for yes, example, yes. Yeah, yeah, or, yeah. Yeah. I, can I jump in with uh, yes, an observation? Of course. I started it, exploring this when I was in Madeira, Portugal, uh -huh. because it's this beautiful, beautiful island, but there were these hideous tunnels everywhere. Hideous, hideous tunnels. And my driver said, oh yeah, the EU insisted. 
that, you know, <laughs> we have these he hideous tunnels everywhere. I'm like, okay. And then I, I was on stage and the people, the local businessmen and women in Madeira were very, their number one issue is there's no direct flights um, to the mainland, mm -hmm. to, to the continent. And the, their MEP, he changed my life. He explained to them and to me that Brussels decides if they get direct flights to the continent. So this whole economy of this whole mm -hmm. island couldn't make their own influence felt and their needs felt. And then he explained to me that he had no power, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, that he could, as an MEP, he could uh, suggest, mm -hmm. but he had no power to pass bills. And that just blew my mind. And he told me the same story. It started as an economic agreement uh, and evolved into this mythological superstructure, uh -huh. right? But sorry, go ahead. But if you d dive into the history of this again, mm -hmm. so I was I was researching the the, the uh, implementation of industrial agriculture after the Second World War, mm -hmm. and um, a lot of that in the Europe was financed through the Marshall money. Interesting. But the condition for the Marshall money was. Uh, E European cooperation? No, European it's our fault. Oh my gosh! No, and, and so it was too. It oh was both overt gosh. policy, but a lot of covert policy. So the CIA under Alan Dulles had a committee for the United States of Europe. No. <laughs> oh. So I can share an article about Please. it. So well, that's very important. So it was a conspiracy. Yeah, and then what's weird as well is that the European Union basically so so the selling point towards the towards the public was we should never have war again. So if there's stronger right, economic cooperation, and that's what people say, why do you want to break up Europe? We have no war, right? Yeah, but it's better to have freedom and EU, war than no freedom and no war. I'm sorry. <laughs> a lot of Nazi criminals that were not tried at Nuremberg were. In Part of the EU, right? Yes. So you're the third person who's told me that. I have to see your sources, but uh -huh. I believe it because um, Flavio Paschino, Paschino yeah. asked me when we were exchanging thoughts about this a couple of days ago, so are you saying that the Nazis never lost? They just went under, kind of went uh -huh. about it a different way and have now prevailed. And I said, yes, that's exactly right. Yeah, I think so too. And I think there are a lot of sources, not just the EU. It's also uh, NAFO. They kept the Reinhard Gaiden intelligence network afloat, and they what is what is NAFO? Uh, NATO. Oh, NATO. NATO. Right. Yeah. So uh, Reinhard Gaiden was the uh, was was the Nazi intelligence master, and his whole spy network was uh, just kept intact completely, <sighs> and it was because they needed to fight the. Russians, oh my God. but they had all these clandestine operations that came out as uh, Gladio, uh, right. where they did these false flags in Europe, where they, uh, where, and this is all public in the public. Um, oh my gosh, uh, uh, Gunter, I forget his first name, but he he wrote about this. Um. Holy cow! So w let me ask you yeah. this: Given that, I mean, it's so interesting to me, and I can't figure it out. Like, why were there sixty years of? you know, this idyllic life in Europe, uh, you know, the open borders, the free museums, the human rights, the education, the universities, the, like, mm -hmm. were they just so brilliant that they wanted to lull Europeans to sleep for a generation so that they could crack down without anyone um, being wary? Like, why, why go through all of that? Because they did establish mm -hmm. beautiful, you know, international criminal court and rights for gay people and, you know, rights for women and environmental laws and like, why? I think it was kind of. I think it's kind of a double system because you believe you have these uh, human rights, but you see, like I think it's very clear with Julian Assange at this moment. Right, you don't. That, right. that when it matters, it doesn't count. Oh, and if I look, like two sets of books almost. Yes. And I think uh, uh, if I look back now, because for a long time I believed in the system as right. well, but if you start studying more and more, then. Throughout all this time, there have been right. people seeing like this is going in the wrong way. Oh. There are like we're losing basic checks and balances, and there have been whistleblowers. Really, but they don't get through to the mass media. So this, these sixty years were not about building up ethical structures. They were mm -hmm. about creating like a Potemkin village behind which the regulations were chipping away, ch chipping away, yes. chipping away at your freedoms. I think I'm sure so. that's true. And when you look at even the basic. Um, institutions of the EU, like this EU bank, European mm -hmm. bank. I, 
I tried to find, like, all this money is flowing from European taxpayers to this European bank. You can't, I couldn't find out who's on the board, how much money do they have, what are they spending their money on? It's totally not transparent. Like, you're being, uh -huh. like, our treasure is being sucked into Ukraine, right? Uh -huh. But your treasure is being vacuumed into this black hole of a bank that's uh -huh. it, not a public bank, right? It doesn't have transparency. Did uh -huh. you know that? Yes, but the Federal Reserve doesn't either, right? You're right. <laughs> yes. You're right. But these are insane systems. The Federal yes. Reserve is, an, is a private structure as well. It's it's deranged that that. Um, I think that's actually the root of the poisonous tree. Because really? yes, why? Um, because you're in a debt mod a debt model, right. and I think uh, oh, so. There's this book, and uh, so there are a lot of. All the times when they experimented with a system where uh, money is printed based just on the productivity of the people and it's not a debt-based system, right. the country flourishes. Of course. And uh, there are short work weeks. Um, it, it just flourishes. Sure. And there's a lot of wealth and um, there's uh, less inequality. Right. So I believe that if we have our own free system, right. That's not debt-based. We can have flourishing economies. Certainly, we're, we are all in this debt-based model with the Biz Bank on top, and the uh, which bank? Biz Bank. Is that what I, the, the bank, bank I'm bank describing? Of, bank of International Central ones. So that's above all the central banks. Oh, it's above the European bank. And that was actually started to to for the for the for the German pay, re, retribution payments. Right, uh, right. Um, but that's above all the central banks. Wow. But I think if you look at the financial system, we're basically all in this model of debt slavery. Right. And from that, everything goes. And by managing these money streams, you can buy up all the assets and you have this whole centralization of assets right now. So if you want to change this, that, that will be the biggest lever for ch system change, I believe. But if you have your sovereignty back, you can pass laws to not engage with structures yes. like that. Yeah, and if and you, in yes. fact, I mean, it's so interesting. One of the disturbing but fascinating things I've been learning is a lot of um, smart, uh, visionary Dutch people I've met are planning to exile themselves to places like El Salvador, mm -hmm. Nicaragua, South, Amer South Africa, you know, really mm -hmm. interesting choices. Um, Panama, right? And I guess that some of those are countries that are saying no to mm -hmm. these economic systems. How do you see that? Because uh, I thought a lot about like the 30s of the previous century and people that decided to leave and it was wise to leave. Yeah. But right now I feel this is a global plan. Yeah, it and, is. And I also feel that in my own country, even if it's bad, like I know the language, I know the culture, I have the heritage. So I feel most grounded here to give yeah. opposition. Yeah. And and if I go to another country where, where I'm a refugee, basically, right. Right. Uh, what what is my power to do something? Th that's uh, but right. uh, at the same time, under, I understand the people who leave because right. sometimes it feels also daunting. Because yeah. yeah, that was one of my questions. What what uh, I think the current situation? It's so weird that so many very big crimes have been committed in plain sight, mm -hmm. and a majority of the people still appear blind to it. So you feel sometimes also a bit powerless almost, right, right. like, what are you going to what do? do? Or, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a lot of questions. It's not sure. just one question. <laughs> well, you... But as it should be, like, you're right to ask, especially, you know, as a parent, right? Because mm -hmm. what is the future? I mean, this is exactly, so I'm Jewish, and my um, grandmother lost nine brothers and sisters in the Holocaust. And my former father-in-law, you know, was a child in Berlin, and, you know, his family left in the nick of time, but they lost everything. I guess what I'm saying there is, this is a reasonable set of questions right now. Um, I'll tell you our family's thought process. And we're not in the same country, obviously, that you are. But my husband, who has who is a veteran and a, comes from the intelligence community, um, and so knows geopolitics very deeply, when I say things like, let's go to Costa Rica, let's get out of here, mm -hmm. you know, he says there's nowhere to go to. You know, it's it, as you say, you know, it's a global coup. There's and you have to stay and fight. So that's our decision. Um, I would say that I, th I do believe deeply in patriotism, right? I do believe in, and I've been trying to tell, like, I don't mean to tell Europeans anything because who am I, mm -hmm. right? What do I know? 
But on the other hand, I do think Europeans have been bullied like Dutch people with a Dutch heritage, mm -hmm. French people with a French heritage, British people with a British heritage, et cetera. They've been bullied into not expressing out loud love of heritage, love of culture, love of country, mm -hmm. need for boundaries, because that's supposed to be racist now, right? And I'm saying as the daughter and granddaughter of immigrants, it's not racist uh -huh. to love your country. There's nothing racist about thinking we are Dutch, we need borders mm -hmm. because we are a republic. We Republic needs borders. You can't, everybody can't just walk in and out and be citizens. That's not how republics work or democracies work. Um, and we have heritage and we have a language. That's not a racial thing, right? Mm -hmm. That's a, that's patriotism. That's honoring your ancestors and, honor, and, and honoring your culture. And I guess the big revelation that I go into in detail in this book is the globalists understood better than we do how precious a local culture is. Right, mm -hmm. because they aimed all of this—the mass migration, the you know TikTok, the you know sexualization of children, all of it—to destroy our cultures and our community. Right. Mm -hmm. So I guess what I would say to you is, I think, I think that there's been a massive propaganda to try to stop people from feeling like I'm Dutch, my place mm -hmm. is here, I'm going to defend my country and my culture and my boundaries and my borders. I'm French, I'm German, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and, and in order to fight this fight, people need to feel that again. And I would say, this is my you know, subjective conclusion, that again, the nation state is the most perfect, I think spiritually perfect mm -hmm. shape human organization has ever taken, the democratic nation state. And to have a democratic nation state sustain itself, you need patriots. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you need winter soldiers, as, as George Washington said, not the summer, summer soldiers, but the winter soldiers. They're the ones who stick it out, right, to defend their country and their culture. Um, so I, I would say to you, mm -hmm. these are very personal decisions, but the only chance Europe has of being free again, and the future is not mm -hmm. going to be better, right, if people mm -hmm. are silent. I've studied fascism long enough to know that speaking out now is not nearly as dangerous as being silent now, uh -huh. right? Um, but if, if Dutch don't defend the Netherlands, regain their sovereignty, get direct democracy, um, get out of this debt system, mm -hmm. uh, defend their borders, close their borders, you know, <clears throat> mm -hmm. make their own conscious decisions about how much immigration they want, when they want it, how they're acculturating people mm -hmm. who, to become Dutch and so on, um, then, then Europe cannot regain its freedom like it's that dire. So I, I think Dutch people and French people and German people, et cetera, et cetera, have to stop thinking just for themselves and their families, but I give a special pass to single moms because I was a single <laughs> mom, like you need to think for yourself and your family. But everyone who can afford to fight for their country should stay and fight for their country. That's my view. So what are the best, because, yeah, this is a large jump back. In the beginning, you spoke about the dependency on the state. So I was looking into the history, and I read this book on the unification of the Netherlands. And around 1900, it said, like, the taxes were very, very low. The state were very small. Mm -hmm. And they thought there shouldn't be, like, a lot of intrusion by the state in the people's lives. And care of the poor, education, mm -hmm. even judiciary, everything was taken care of mm -hmm. by, of, at the local level, local level by an elite of farmers. Mm -hmm. And then I think that's 125 years. And how, and, and what do we have now? Like what is a, it's, it's very, the society is very atomized. So, mm -hmm. so where's the real community? Like mm -hmm. it's people living very individually. So we need, so to perhaps to hold the culture, we need to rebuild that again. Mm -hmm. But even if I look at how everybody is living, I sometimes think, how are we going to do that again? Yeah. Where to start? Yeah, that's a great question. I love that you're asking, and everyone watching, I'd encourage them to do the same, asking very concrete questions, how, instead of theoretical questions. Because people, when they give up, they start to ask theoretical questions because they can't act on them, right? It's just like, what's going on, whatever. But you're, you're asking real practical questions. That's what warriors do, right? <laughs> no, because we're in a battle. And the thing I didn't mention that you guys have to get back is your guns. That's just on the wish list <laughs> for self-defense. Not, you know, I'm not, I don't want to get arrested at the airport. I'm not calling for armed revolution. But um, the Second Amendment, as you read in this book, is a 
really important because when the war is being waged against citizens, citizens need to prevent the state from waging war against them, right? Mm -hmm. by, by gun ownership. Um, so the how. I, you know, it's funny you mention this because I saw a beautiful book yesterday called Het Dorp. Am I pronouncing it correctly? The Village. Mm -hmm. And it was exactly this period, 1900 to 1910, in the Netherlands. Um, so beautiful. People looked thriving. Small businesses were thriving. I'm sure there were problems. I'm sure there <laughs> were diseases and people being trafficked and child labor and so on. But um, what you're describing is utopia, right? A mm -hmm. democratic utopia, the local accountability. Mm -hmm. um, people deciding in a community from the ground up what their needs are, which are different mm -hmm. from community to community. Um, and that intact community emotionally as well. We need that. Your, our kids need it. You know, our, our elders need it. Um, and again, like you, you find out what's valuable by seeing what was torn apart by the globalists over the yeah. last four years. They went for the churches. They went for the synagogues and mosques. Why? Not just because they don't like God, obviously, but because that, that atomized society, mm -hmm. you know, most completely, they went for the schools. They, they tore us apart on purpose for exactly this reason. So I've been, community is pretty easy to reestablish, I've found. Um, and I'm a big believer in the potluck. <laughs> Meaning, you you must know 50 people. Everyone watching knows 50 people. They might not all be friends. They might not all work well in a cocktail party. But if the goal is what do we do, right? How do mm -hmm. we restore our power locally? Um, you invite 50 people, your contractor, your electrician, your teacher, your doctor, your, you know, like every everyone you know from all walks of life. Um, and you ask them to bring food because food is really important for building community. <laughs> and you have a potluck. I don't know if you if yes, would know. translate that, but basically everyone just brings food. And then you literally say, okay, what do we need? If every if all the systems go down, what do we need? Or what do we need to um, have self-determination? That's the question. And then when you've got 50 people in a room, you have an incredible, like geometrically scaled amount of skill sets. Mm -hmm. So someone will say, well, I know a farmer, you mm -hmm. know, and I can get look, food brought in if you guys will, if we form a, you know, a purchasing club, um, you know, let's buy a half a cow. And someone else will say, well, um, I can fix your computer if it goes down. And someone else will say, this is really important. You need to start teaching your kids. So mm -hmm. they're not only getting indoctrinated by the state. I understand it's hard to homeschool, <laughs> which is very bad in, in mm -hmm. the Netherlands. Someone needs to say, okay, I'm going to take the kids once a week to play soccer or to do Bible study or the classics of Dutch literature or whatever you want to mm -hmm. teach them, right? Um, whatever that community wants to teach them. Okay, I can babysit, you know, for an evening a week so that all the new moms and dads can, you know, go to a movie or go have a party or whatever to keep that community going. Um, all right, well, I know how to use a rifle. I can teach people in an emergency. Well, I don't know if that's legal in the Netherlands. You need to change the law for that. <laughs> or I know how to run for office. All We need to elect you on our local council. Like mm -hmm. we talked about parliament, but I don't know the system more locally. There's got to be a local council system that people can run for, right? That's very powerful. Um, and then you can also do things like, this sounds mean, but the public health officials who suffocated our kids, right? Um, my husband pointed out from his own work destabilizing other societies, that it's very effective to run people out of your community, not violently, mm -hmm. but to just, you know, shun them, uh, tell mm -hmm. people what they did, make their deeds transparent, to, uh, file police reports against them. These people hurt your kids, mm -hmm. right? Or they defrauded you into getting injections. On a local level, you know who they are. So have them move on, have them move on, make their lives miserable. Um, I'm sorry to be mean, and I know that's not mm -hmm. a very Dutch attitude is not a Canadian attitude, but look what happened to Canada. But it's time for us to be mean, to protect our communities, our families, to keep people from committing crimes against us mm -hmm. until our judicial system works properly. So that's those are some ideas, but to really localize, you know, everything you possibly can, and then to create like a, a local um, 
you know, they're making laws without your consent, make laws without their consent. Create a local community council without anyone's consent uh -huh. that decides on an agenda. Okay, they're trying to put a dump here. Who's tasked with putting pressure on that? To, you know, on those decision makers. Let's find out how the decision is made. We're going to task you with going on behalf of our community to stop this or to, you know, bring something else to our community. And then what you've got, if people do this across the Netherlands, what Parliament and the EU will find is they have a non-compliant Netherlands. And that mm -hmm. is the most important thing we can do right now is not comply and have our own power sources so that they don't have leverage points against us. Oh, I love that answer. <laughs> it's very hopeful. Uh, Thank you. And I think the lockdowns actually kind of stimulated that because everyone who didn't comply, they went into, there were all these uh, meetings at home. And That's true. Yes. So that I mean, look what we built without even, just out of desperation, without even a plan. You guys have a you know, I'm sure it's a struggle to be in the trenches, but a thriving alternative media, you manage to keep the light, a little light of civilization and reason alive with nothing, right? Um, mm -hmm. Starting out with nothing. And we have a big revolution in half the country starting out with nothing but desperation. So if that's what we can do just out of like, what the heck is going on? This is lunacy, uh, self-defense, freak out mm -hmm. time. Imagine what we can accomplish if we sit down with our neighbors and plan an agenda. I don't mean a, a global agenda like the, mm -hmm. the movements always get derailed by being like, oh, but what about Palestine? You know, like God bless Palestine. What about, you know, women's rights or trans rights? No, just focus on what your community needs. And the other thing it does is it creates wonderful relationships um, at the community level that, that make you feel very confident in facing down um, the menace from Parliament or the EU. So start where you are. So you mentioned uh, Switzerland as an uh, example of the direct democracy because right. before everything happened, I also thought that's kind of the best system. Right. But looking at what happened there in the last couple of years, yeah. they also have a mass media and a corrupted government yeah. and they trust their government. Yeah. So even their system didn't protect them. Right, and they opened a portal to hell. <laughs> 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 so exactly. Um, so I was listening to an interview with the late Aaron Russo, and he said, well, the U.S. is not a democracy, it's a constitutional republic. That's true. And it means that we have these uh, God-given and inalienable rights that are protected, and for the rest, you have your own choice. Mm. And for me, that was such a, because I never learned these things and I never really thought about it. And after everything that happened, I thought, what is democracy? Should we actually have the right to choose with everyone about everything? Because then democracy is a totalitarian system. Mm -hmm. So- I, I mean, can I just jump in there? I, you know, conservatives like to say, it's not a democracy, it's a mm -hmm. constitutional republic. I kind of think they're splitting hairs because we have um, what's a winner takes all system mm -hmm. to get those people to represent us. So it is direct democracy at the level at which you elect your representative. Mm -hmm. And so you can get rid of your representative through direct democracy. So I don't think that answer is complete. Mm -hmm. I mean, I do think ours is a perfect system because, yeah, if you're if you're doing majority rule on everything, it's chaos, mm -hmm. right? Yes. But you do majority rule, you get your representative, then you oust that person if he or she does not represent you. So, but should the amount of topics that the government is allowed to decide on or to protect be limited? I mean, that's up to the people, right? You're asking me, I guess what I, I like ah. about you is you're on a journey of questioning. Mm -hmm you know, the rubric, the matrix that you were handed, right, mm -hmm. about governance in the state. That's what we need to do right now, all of us. I mean, I did it too, you know, I'm still doing it. Um, so in a real robust democracy that results in a representative uh, republic, mm -hmm. you'll decide that, you know, like our, our system, our founders decided that anything that's not enumerated in the constitution reverts to the states. Um, you may decide otherwise, but mm -hmm. it'll be your decision. Yeah. I, you know, and then th that's the great argument, right? The libertarians will argue with the, you know, the left or whatever about what it, what are the limits of what we're we're going to let our 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 elected officials do. But I guess I guess what I want you to question about 
the meat, the, the kind of theoretical basis of your question mm -hmm. <laughs> is it presumes a kind of fixed nexus for mm -hmm. decision making. And in a dynamic democracy, it's always changing. Yeah. You know, if yeah. someone doesn't like, like, look at, look at the fight in Texas, you know, maybe an earlier governor would have been comfortable with the federal government taking over the power of people walking in and out of the southern border of Texas. But this mm -hmm. governor isn't going mm -hmm. along with it. And the people will either reelect this governor or they'll get rid of him, depending on their view of that. Yes. So it's carried by the community. The, yeah, yes. by the citizens. Yes. It goes down to the individual. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we were supposed to talk more about your book, which was pretty dark we as well. We talk about my book. Yes. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think uh, those are such positive notes, actually. So I want to thank you for this thank conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it very much.